We'd like to welcome Dr. Pierre, consultant anesthesiologist at SKMC Hospital in Abu Dhabi, for sharing his knowledge regarding current challenges and opportunities of neuromuscular blockade management. Dr. Pierre, what do you think are the major challenges associated with the neuromuscular blockade management? Clinical practice is extremely difficult to change, particularly when one's entire career decisions regarding neuromuscular management have been guided by subjective assessment of clinical signs of neuromuscular recovery. In fact, almost 20% of European and 10% of US, Australian and New Zealand anesthesiologists never used nerve stimulators to guide management of an NBAs. The literature is replete with studies documenting the inadequacy of subjective assessment and clinical criteria like bedside tests to determine the adequacy of neuromuscular recovery, whether spontaneous or pharmacologic. The current review is intended to underscore the gaps in current clinical practice regarding perioperative management of neuromuscular block and offer evidence of the importance of perioperative objective measurements of neuromuscular function whenever an MBAs are used. We continue to be optimistic and believe that with sufficient education and access to appropriate technology, the clinician will choose to do what is best and safest for the patient. To that end, we need to place current clinical practice in some global perspective. In the United States, the National Hospital Discharge Survey of 2010 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimated the total number of inpatient surgical procedures at 51.4 million. If we reasonably assume that of these surgical cases, 60% receive general anesthesia requiring some form of muscle relaxation, then approximately 30.8 million patients are treated with NBAs. We know that conservatively, one third of patients receiving NMBAs and anticholinesterase reversal will exhibit some degree of postoperative residual neuromuscular block, amounting to 10.1 million patients. Of these patients, 0.8% will experience a critical respiratory event, or more than 81,000 patients every year. Worldwide, the number of major surgeries has been estimated to be 234.4 million per year. This means that more than half a million worldwide patients experience critical respiratory events every year. How do you think neuromuscular monitoring would help in spotting those complications and subsequently avoiding them? The ASA lists five requirements of the standards for basic anesthesia monitoring document, last affirmed on October 28, 2015. The presence of qualified anesthesia personnel, oxygenation, ventilation, circulation, and body temperature monitoring. The standards for basic anesthesia monitoring document is silent on the need for neuromuscular monitoring. An updated report by the ASA on practice guidelines for post-anesthetic care now states in the section of neuromuscular function guidelines, assessment of neuromuscular function primarily includes physical examination and on occasion might include an MBA's monitoring. These recommendations are based on the committee's assessment of the evidence of the effectiveness of neuromuscular monitoring as category B2B. However, because of the continuing patient safety implication of postoperative residual weakness, many have urged all anesthesia societies, national and international, to urgently create practice guidelines and standards governing the clinical management and monitoring of an NBAs. We wholeheartedly agree and encourage clinicians to embrace the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland standards for neuromuscular monitoring. Quantitative neuromuscular monitoring devices objectively measure residual blockade and display the results numerically in real time. The tough stimulation pattern is most commonly used to assess NMBAs when quantitative devices are employed. The TOF ratio, or T4 to T1 ratio, should exceed 0.9 or 90% to 
in order to exclude clinically significant muscle weakness. Maintenance of the availability to swallow and protection against aspiration of pharyngeal fluids can only be assured above this minimum level of neuromuscular recovery. Partial recovery of muscle function to top ratios less than 0.9 in volunteers and surgical patients is associated with a variety of postoperative adverse events. The use of quantitative monitoring was shown to be effective in an identifying and reducing the risk of residual blockade. The acceleromyography devices are small, portable, and designed for intraoperative applications. Their routine use in the clinical setting has been limited by initial acquisition costs, $800 to $2,400, the need for experience with acceleromyography monitoring to obtain accurate results, the unavailability of appropriate electrode placement sites when the patient's arm untucked under surgical drapes, and limitations of the technology in the AOR. Like requirement for baseline measurements and normalization, the long 5 to 10 minutes setup required before used, and reduced precision in awake patients. Many studies, however, have documented these technologies and questionable efficacy in decreasing the incidence of residual numeroscal block in both adult and pediatric patients. If emergence from anesthesia and tracheal extubation are allowed to occur only after adequate neuromuscular function has been attained, as documented by a measured tough uh, ratio more than 0.9, then these complications will and must become never events. Neuromuscular function assessment with a PNS is mandatory whenever neuromuscular blocking drugs, both depolarizing and non depolarizing, are used. In short, neuromuscular monitoring is not optional, and national societies must propose recommendations for the rational and safe management of perioperative neuromuscular blockers and their antagonists. Thank you, Dr. Pierre, for sharing this valuable information. Looking forward to hearing from you soon about recent updates in anesthesia.